So and the design of the professor at the University of Kukuli. And um, his work really comes at more specifically in and geographical boundaries. As I mentioned, Anderson is a scholar's solution to the field of sociology, monarchy, and welfare system have had profound and lasting impacts in our understanding of welfare states, family, and monarchy, and system. And so today, we're really going to ask some questions about his career and his current work with monarchy and link this to kind of password on workers. Okay. Yeah, um, we'll start with the question of the spirit of the slavery program. Um, you have a very multinational, a very multidisciplinary career. So, why don't you just tell us a little bit about how it unfolded, what um, opportunities or challenges did you face or in the spending context across disciplinary boundaries? And, um, and I guess, particularly in Shingas, then you started your career in the West. And then we return to your religious song, like your relation of the comments, and maybe there's also about that as well. Well, yeah. <clears throat> it, I think it, it all, of course, began in uh, Denmark. That's now I grew up most of my childhood and adulthood, and where I was studying at the University of Copenhagen. Um, and uh, I was interested in sociology, but also in demographic issues. And then more, very demography, oddly enough, uh, there was one demography course in economics, and I was studying both economics, labor economics, and our studying sociology at the same time. So I took one course in demography at uh, University of Copenhagen, and I, uh, well, I, I liked it, but I also thought it was a little bit boring the way it was delivered. Uh, but it ignited my interest in demographic issues already at that early, so undergraduate level uh, stage of my, my studies. And uh, the other part, the uh, reason I sought help for that in part had to do with sociology. Was in that time in Denmark really, really It was almost exclusively very qualitative and really had no profile of international uh, level whatsoever. Uh, so, being a little bit ambitious and being primarily curious about these issues. Of sociology and of labor economics and so on. So on. I thought I'm going to go and study in, in the US. Uh, and then I started exploring a little bit about where in the US. Uh, and it quickly became clear to me that the University of Wisconsin was a top priority. It was at that time a top program in the US. And in, in Wisconsin's program fit exactly also some of my interests, which were combining with some studying social inequality, more sociological, and also more uh, emphasis on demography, which, of course, is, has an all of them very big in Wisconsin. So uh, that would be released. They accepted me, uh, so I was very happy about that. Uh, and then, uh, so in the, the, this was in the 70s, I moved to Wisconsin and pursued this, this PhD there. I uh, studied with uh, various professors and courses and so forth. It was a very, very rigorous PhD program. Uh, uh, at that time, it was a very, very demanding, and you really swing uh, a lot. <laughs> uh, so I, I finished the PhD in the early 70s, uh, and uh, then by chance, I was offered a 
assistant professor which started a job at Harvard University. And I thought, wow, that really is something. So I said yes immediately. Um, and then I spent uh, eight years at Harvard, first as an assistant, then as a as a, a associate professor. But they never gave tenure to me at Harvard at that time. They started me after that. Uh, so it was clear to me that you know, do up to eight years, but then I would assume and then I had to think else. Uh, I was also uh, promoted to be what they at Harvard call a head tutor. The head tutor is the one who is responsible for the whole undergraduate teaching program. Uh, and uh, so I also ran that parallel with other courses and with, and it allowed me to reduce my course a little bit better. That was one advantage of being a head tutor. The other one was I had my own private secretary, which was also a luxury for somebody who was just out of that PhD basically. Um, and then uh, at Harvard, I worked very much with, uh, especially uh, at the time he died, and so, but they called me Raylon. Uh, who was a, a leading figure in some research on social gratification, social inequalities at that time, and also an extremely generous and very, very sweet person to work with. And he kind of took care of us. Uh, because uh, at that time, the Harvard Department was being hungry by fiction. It was still dominated by the old. Great man, I Falcon Parsons was even still there, uh, but he died two years after I arrived. Um, and he was extremely conflictual, to say that. <laughs> also, Daniel Bell was there, equally conflictual. And so, there was this constant tension in the department and every, everything that. Oh, the whole atmosphere was, was, was not very pleasant. Uh, but you could carve out little sort of corners. One of my corners was with the rainwater, and another one was with Orlando Patterson, uh, who, who was working. This is mine, but who became a very good friend of mine. Um, so I had into the corners, and then of course, among the junior faculty, we kind of shielded ourselves off a little bit. And, uh, so uh, then he, the end of the eight year period. And uh, so I was faced there with what to do next. Um, I went in the job market and uh, I had just finished my first book, um, so the bar scene, uh, and uh, that was kind of my human capital uh, to go on the job market. Uh, so I started applying for jobs um, in the United States, uh, and. Uh, and then I was offered a job at the University of Michigan uh, in, in the social department there. Um, and I uh, thought, do I really need to go and get an hour for the next 10 to 15 years? Or they did the probably a 10 year professorship. So it was, it was very, you know, very attractive from a professional point of view. But from the personal life perspective, it was not particularly attractive. And then I was also thinking, yeah, I have to go back. Uh, so, uh, with the intervention of some rainwater, uh, I went one year to the South Center in Berlin, 
uh, where we had a project together. Uh, the Green Water B and then at Berlin. So I spent a year in Berlin and uh, I must say, by the March. Neither at that time the Sun Center was 100% fair to the character. And I had been German and I felt totally as an outsider. So I felt very happy there also. Living in the city where I can I knew nobody and I didn't get to it, you know anybody I had there except one one American uh, I met. <laughs> so my circle life was so virtually zero. And then I said I I, I don't you know in should I return to Denmark? But sociology in Denmark continued to be really terrible. And uh, there were also no positions in Denmark to apply to. So that was a dead end to go back to Denmark, although that was my priority. And then came the European University uh, possibility. And I applied here and, they, and I was accepted. And so I came here and uh, uh, one of the reasons I was very attracted to come to was that my fiance was in Italian. And uh, so I, I, had, uh, I, I didn't know him, um, but I found him to be very attractive and also at the university at that time of service. And I mean, this changed completely. But it was very small at that time. And, very, very young, I think it only had 10 years on his back when I arrived, something like that. Uh, so I came here and I found myself very in perfect harmony with the place. Um, good. Also, I didn't have to teach very much, it was uh, mainly. Um, advising PhD students, there were very few PhD students uh, to begin with, so there was a huge amount of time to research. And uh, and what, uh, what I was really uh, centered on was when I was to work with the rainwater and uh, that project the sunset of the wind, that's when I moved my interest towards the welfare state. And uh, so I used this opportunity of coming here with all the time available for research and a lot of certain money available to us as well uh, to really develop this welfare state research. And I had very much Interactions with Walter Kordi, who's a Swedish, who's a, a Swedish, leading Swedish sort of policy expert, um, and I worked a lot with him on the project on welfare state comparisons. And uh, so I used the time here to develop what became three words of welfare capitalism uh, as, the, as my first when I was here, and I just exploited the fact that we had sort of endless time available and a lot of secretarial assistance and everything was just so generous for from the point of view of the pandemic and very pleasant from the point of view of social life, living, etc. here. So I bought a house here in the Outside of the games and you near know, the thing from it, uh, and uh, even after, after the end of the biggest number of years that you could be a plus year, uh, you know, you're in the university at that time, it's shorter than it is now, now it's 12 years at that time. I don't think there were speakers, but they need to be able to they wanted me to stay in the next years. Uh, so it ended up in 19 years, I was here. 
And then I was uh, editing once in Italy, and I was offered a job at the University of Trento, but continued to live here. And then, so I had, I can see I had one leg at the European University and my other leg at Trento, and uh, I continued for another eight years. And then I got married. Uh, to a woman, and that was the reason uh, she couldn't get a job in this, which was the Congress. Um, and so, in, in order to, to resolve her problem, we decided to listen to Boston. And I was not with the awful decision there, and the professorship at the European Ends at the Hungarian University in Boston. And uh, that's how I ended up in Barcelona. I knew, uh, lost contact with all my sort of activities and ongoing, I had ongoing activities with colleagues here in Italy and so so, so I, I, I continued to have a lot of kind of uh, connections going on in Italy, even though I had in Barcelona. And uh, I was invited to the club for two lives for the same half a year here to the European University somewhere around 2017 2018, but about five years ago, uh, just to give you an example, the Pony Uh Before I became Professor Pony, I was going there. Regularly for music, just teaching a course uh, there. So, as I was saying, but I never really lost contact with my Italian side, my Italian academic side. So, I had this going on parallel all the time. Um, so, that's sort of how I started in Denmark and ended up here. Well, here, yeah, when I ended up in Barcelona. And, um, yeah, that's about it. Yeah. That's really interesting. And I, I spoke to you that um, so much coming together while you were in the watch to your professional, personal, interest in the space that you're going to need to sort of offer that to you to be really productive. Well, your signature work. So it's, uh, all right, now I'm jumping on the more new interviews and like modern aspects. So you have, it's a book, right? I've said to it as a yeah, but it's a book that is about kind of the emergence or reemergence of that thing in the Canadian country. And kind of talking that I think it can be more central besides the fact that we've seen massive years, if you like the really maybe great of marriage, also forcing. So I'm just curious to see, to know a bit more about it, actually to see if your name is on, if it was an agent or family on France, and that's kind of in ECOS, uh, what I've kind of read, and the work of Scrap, that's diverging the same. No, I call this like kind of phenomenon where, yes, families of the small idea created or more stable and more menace, and kind of more straight southern coaches and overseas, while Actually, there's more of a, how would you say, like a family weakening for the less people. Single mom and dad, where the other two, they are like, it's more than us. So, we have to first about this. We can have family in which times. Well, yeah, uh, this is also the theme, of course, of my talk on the year today. So, it would be a little bit repetitive. And um, yeah, I, I started this been my main research theme for the past 10 or 15 years with being family and all. We still live in a little of, I said, revisiting my graduate student days at uh, the University of Wisconsin. And you uh, saw so true interesting. We get into that. So, 
My career is often multiple disciplinary. I remember when I, when I was stricken this year, but also continuing uh, in Barcelona, I was getting I was given job offers from the US only the science department and the sociology departments. And uh, even though my heart is sociology and my brain is uh, I guess my brain is still there. <laughs> um, so I, well, I didn't want to go back to the US in the 80s. Uh, but uh, I spent a lot of years studying books. And at one point, I think Boston, I've said what I had once said, and no more. But I also, and this is, I'm going to also uh, repeat this again. When I was a student in uh, Denmark, uh, I met this uh, woman who, again, a woman, I forgot what discipline she was in. Uh, and anyhow, she convinced me that in order to have a good life, you should change career at least three times across the label. Now, I could, I couldn't and didn't want to do that. I wanted to be an academic surgeon. But I, I changed my research themes three times. So I started to search democracy. Then I went into welfare states and spent a lot of years in the welfare states. And then I said, enough about welfare states. I, I have nothing more to answer. Um, and it's just, I thought I was going to need to repeat myself. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the milieu of what state research that I was in is a very pleasant year of tennis, not only very, very talented. I'm a researcher. But I just saw myself in meetings, seminars, and and I'm such it seemed more and more competitive. And uh, I was I was doing new and interesting. I wasn't getting most of it anymore. And that's the point. Uh, I'm just moving by research fields in a pretty clear and clear hard way. And this works. Interesting in the different issues. We had a lot to do with changing family life that we would observe everywhere in my certain stadium. It was very clear. So the past was not very difficult for me to. Uh, well, and, and the one thing that uh, is that came pretty much from some point. Well, we sorry, sorry. What had to do with the dominance of this sort of uh, the second demographic transition uh, thesis? Less hard and we look at what more less hard and especially space social and for that. That are, and that has been accepted by demographers almost long stop in there. Mm -hmm. And I would get it. it this postmodern decline of the family, which is the socks big argument, and which is the nuts and bolts, the second graphic transition thesis, I was going to say, uh, I don't think, I think. I don't think it, it corresponds to real, the, the, the real reality of dynamics of family change. And my starting point was that I was made to observe that among higher people, uh, they were beginning to adopt a very, very different kind of arrangement, but you know, two career paths. And here by Empirical base of very much Scandinavian reality, where this was most intense, right? But also the West. But Scandinavia 
was my starting point, where I was observing these two career families, or couples, in which the woman was basically actually masculinizing her work life, uh, except for maybe a maternity leave absence to a uh, with a two child. Uh, kind of uh, standard. Otherwise, she was a full time. Uh, so I was observing this, and I think at the same time, these couples were beginning to look more and more stable. They were having a number of children. They were sorry, and then I started digging into this, and that's where I. I, I, I really got into, uh, on the one hand, uh, looking in very different alternatives to the second round of transition pieces, where, as you were getting at, uh, the hybrid people are beginning to be the pioneers of a new family model. But they, and with the resources that they have, and in India, with also the, the very generous family support from the state, the child care services, I was beginning to see a new family model. So that is unfolding there as a the parallel that low ratio data. We're becoming more and more uh, unstable in their permanent, in their kind of co life, and they were, and more and more, uh, more and more instances of percentages of people with no children whatsoever, or uh, especially also the breakdown of. Uh, couples increasingly very dramatically. So I would really see this for As I said, there were two things or two things that were coming together. To, yes. And the other one was sort of my, my own economics um, background that kind of came back to me there. Uh, where I said what what I thought is as I an absolute institution to that of second environment was that we were really in a world of sort of uh, multiple people. So I started re examining all the dynamics, both historically and then up to today, of family change. Thinking about it in terms of it would be good change, uh, the way economists think about that and such a, uh, concept of some multiple behavior, which is, I mean, it's no thinking, conceptualist people. Uh, so we had a little bit of a very stable two child, three child family in the post war era. Housewife dedicated totally to family life and him being the sole earner. That only could be grown and somehow or other to disintegrate. And what was the catalyst of that? If you study computer theories, you will know that you need some kind of certain shocks. Otherwise, they could be doing it just basically to perpetuate itself. <clears throat> so I sort of, what are some of the shocks that led to the decline, the road of the whole family leader? And one of them clearly was the kid. And if that, I'm not the first to say that. The other one, and this is more. What I was looking at was also the time saving of the old housewife. 
uh, think, think of the um, uh, uh, washing of uh, clothes. In, in this poor washing machine, you can think about three hours of how to do a by hand washing clothes. They now takes two minutes huh, to put the clothes in, soak, and then burst them out. So it was huge in time saving. And you could, you could see the time saving across so many fields that were the traditional housewife role. Uh, so the, the, the three uh, meant that the housewife role was beginning to be a busy absurd uh, waste of time, you no? Know? And at the same time, the opportunity cost of being a housewife was rising because you could, and as an alternative, make money and then have more income to the family that allowed you to buy a nice car and a nice house. To and that was a shame. Uh, but the question was, uh, do you have a new state of family in your revolving in that big And uh, I'm going to talk about that uh, later today. I don't know if you more to talk about that now. Uh, but I believe it's evolving, but so far we can only see it that amount of energy. And the conditions for it to evolve are pretty severe. <laughs> The question that I have for is really linked to this, and then I'll put it in. But I, so, from like, the book, and like also looking at some of your like, the, uh, it seems that there's a new family delivering us that really hinges on still men doing things. Because we've seen that actually men's and awful like, work in the gym, and then what has changed that much in the past 50 years, while all of us entering the lady most of the past, right? But in kind of this augmentation for men to more, so it kind of not the most predicted, the, sorry, the strongest predictor of men doing more in the household was women having this expected full time career. But to have this expected full time career, you kind of need, like, we know that one day events that kind of um, changes women's career and really hinders that in yes, some and that, in the same time, increases the household share, like, share that the woman has to be because we have to be mom of the child here. Um, and so it seems that you know, for one to change, the other one to change, and for the household share to change, like men have to to change, but it kind of seems to be like, you know, egg and chicken. So like, what would be a way? So we see that in Niga, we can imagine that. In Italy or in Spain, whether gender and bacterium, like it or very different, like the norms. How do you manage to arrive to this new It's where you need those three things, but it's kind of like where to manage the things. Changing the the chicken and the egg. Yeah. I think uh, there, there are couple things that are involved in the chicken and the egg. Um one of them is simply the, the time necessary to do household tasks has diminished so dramatically uh, over the past three decades or so, or decades or so, so that uh, entering into doing these tasks is much easier than it was in the past. So the men see that, all right, she is asking me uh, to also contribute, and she doesn't have time because she's not a full time employee. Uh, so, entering from the point of view of the male, which they feel like said, no, household tests for women, childcare tests for women. Uh, I am going to go football games and then, and then making friends. But entering into the traditional food levels, housework and so on, cooking, men start usually 
in terms of present activities, they start with the ones with the one kind of activities that are more pleasant, like cooking, uh, <laughs> gardening. Uh, yeah, but then they're more of the gardening. They they start cooking, but into into household tasks became much easier and less threatening from male or you because the tasks required much less time. Uh, most of them were done very quickly. Uh, or they were done to jointly in a group together. Uh, there is this feminist literature that has dominated uh, very much our discussion on these issues for decades now about the double shift of, of, of women. Uh, the empirical uh, evidence paper of it is relatively marginal. At least in Scandinavia, you don't see double shift at all. Uh, in fact, uh, the average male who did normally sleep in Denmark, the average male in the partnership or the family, uh, contributes more than 40% of total uh, household. And child care is even some more. Uh, so we are also going to that again today. We even had a Denmark place. I am just saying, I with that. That uh, thirds of men that are partnered in Denmark, they do more housework time than the wife or the female. So you have actually gender symmetry in evolving, uh, but. It's mainly from Chicago, from medium higher to Chicago. And the low Chicago men are falling down. And one of the things that we you know is very, very clearly in those, in these kind of more advanced society of family and democracy is that the low Chicago men are falling down in also in terms of. Uh, partnering to gain them. Women don't want to partner very low educated men because they know what they're walking into by being partnered to an unskilled, uneducated, uh, male. Namely, about alcohol, law of unemployment, uh, very uncertain lives, and very little inclination to Participate in uh, taking care of the kids, have kids to do it, and, or helping out with that. So, uh, women in sort of the lower unit uh, part of, the, of society, there they are fearing that partnering implies uh, double shift. Huh? And uh, I think that also has to do with the high degree of divorce or separation uh, rates that you find among the lower community. And that has been increasing, uh, at least in, in, in that aspect, like both in the US and in Scandinavia. It's interesting to hear you talk about the Scandinavian civil society that makes me think about the role of policy and politics in some of these trends. So, um, you know, an example of a, of a highly educated Danish couple who have children and are also benefiting from their insurance part of their system, um, which, is, which is in place there. And not necessarily elsewhere. It's interesting actually that elsewhere, sometimes that child goes to like informal, which sort of reinforces the class mm -hmm. answer. Um, but I'm curious, sort of, from your perspective, as someone who has um, really taught us that politics matters for social policy, um, what would it take politically to implement more optimal or for this new equilibrium um, 
Coalitions emerging It's interesting because the 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 coalitions that were sort of were well received formation initially industrial workers and party allies. Those coalitions may not be as either they didn't exist anymore or the best relevant or sometimes they didn't close to some of these these policies. Um, so from your perspective, what will people Well, let me start with um, um, something that uh, very few people are aware of. Um, when Scandinavian countries can get Denmark as the prime example, um, in the 70s, it, when it started the first unfolding, it was a developing child care policies and so on. So on. Um, the impetus behind the childcare exchange politically had nothing to do with creating gender equality or supporting a uh, kind of more egalitarian family interests here. The reason behind the politics was that you had a labor village. And there were two options, imports, uh, like Germany did, uh, lady from uh, third world countries, Germany did. Or you have a labor reserve, uh, work, workforce reserve, which is called women. And Scandinavian opted for women instead of terms. And that was the start point of expansion. They also, we had a huge literature that I was working on, which has to do with that early child care, it's very important for the generation of the child. And especially uh, in favor of children from low child parents. They get a uh, cognitive boost from high quality care. Scandinavian often initially for very high quality care, not in order to invest in children at all. That didn't occur at all to any policy. It was all about that you needed high quality child care in order to induce the women to uh, enter into the labor force and uh, park their children in a uh, public uh, child care. Uh, institution. They wanted to, they, in order to induce women to work, you had to have their own. So that is the political origins of a whole sort of new gender egalitarianism that Scandinavian groups have nothing to do with gender They have to do with origin. It is a byproduct. And that's what we've got to be very careful about. We interpret what the politics matter. Politics matter. But in this case, they, they matter for all lots of women, not for women, but not for domestic children. <laughs> so, uh, politics matter. Then you push next to with, um, the kind of uh, coalitions that originally sponsored work of development are in, in, in Scandinavia, which was the unique ability of Scandinavian countries to create a coalition between the men of the working class, represented by Central Democracy, and the farm labor class, rural classes. Uh, that were represented by other parties. They could coalesce, uh, because both classes needed sovereignty. They could not coalesce in virtually any other European country. Uh, Netherlands is a little bit of an exception 
via their democracy. But otherwise, you don't see that coercion in virtue else. And in Germany, it was impossible. That coercion and that also in uh, maths and so on and so on. Uh, so in, in most of Europe, the work class stood alone and could not build a majority that would then translate into the politics of policy that would benefit the, the working class, uh, like it happened in Scandinavia with universal pensions. I mean, this is stuff that I worked on. 30 years ago, whatever it was. So, today, what are the coefficients that are uh, Well, here I'm a little bit more on, so, speculative, which is an area that I'm studying. Uh, but, what, what, it looks to me, you know, most of the work I did in 12 years ago, and I think it's, is that we now have the dominance of sort of white collar, uh, medium educated, uh, electoral basis, and then of course the higher education. So the educational profile of the lecturer is changing completely, and so the manual works from Bakaman or Ontario. So you need new co business, uh, in order to build any kind of manual. Sustainable and uh, and that has to that has to be built on where the mass is. The problem is that the white cone mass is in charge of quite divided. Uh, but the one thing that is very striking that even if you have new political parties emerging that seem to be cross parties and uh, against the old, for example, the, the People's Parties in, in Norway and Denmark, and these kind of new, so sort of fascist kind of parties that we're seeing right like now. Uh, their rhetoric was very much on the old class and the low end of white power. So, the service language. Huh? And but they are still. Completely behind welfare policies. What they are not behind is conversion. So, so the, 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 the weakening of the, uh, the ability of coalitions has not, not, nothing to do with the weakening of support for certain policies, uh, especially family, as far as I can see. That formulation of women are Turks is, I think, really going to say in the end. Is it it's women or Turks? Um, oh. Because I think it's also the, a very interesting political point of understanding. To some extent, so visible today that governments sort of can choose to maintain the labor force by mobilizing women and providing this economy for foreign workers. Um, and I think they need to be kind and that in many contemporary cases, on supporters of parts that we just mentioned, based on the system, but that the, the choice, the original choice of governments. But you also have convergence. Uh, I think the most interesting ongoing convergence that you're seeing is Germany. Uh, in some in, in, in the epoch of Matt, uh, Merkel's long reign in Germany, where you saw the expansion of China. Uh, and very much, it, it, it was, it's kind of a uh, section of Scandinavian uh, evolution. Uh, high quality, universal child care. Guarantees is, is, has become sort of a hallmark of Jerusalem policy in the last 15 or so years. And it's, it's been expanding incredibly rapidly. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. So, uh, 
Well, what is driving that? Uh, there was some that's the America, the Christian Democratic coalition of Germany was suddenly become like a Danish or Swedish social democracy. It had much to do with both of them. And they see that we've got to do something to reignite for uh, And that is to support women's uh, new role because there's no walking back in terms of women walking. So now, increasingly to have life and careers. And that is just the case even in very traditional Germany. And that's increasingly the case uh, throughout Europe also sees very from Spain, much more so than in this. Uh, and also the snow expansion in childcare, but unfortunately, quite a lot of one of the Spain for it. So you're seeing a convergence of a lot of what's the democracy pioneered 20, 30 years ago. It's now also more in those countries that look like they were not moving in that direction. And vice versa, the certain democracy dominated uh, political commerce and the media has, has also managed to move them in, uh, in, in the direction of a continental European sort of policy uh, emphasis in particular on social media. So there's a lot, a lot of convergence uh, evolving between the European countries uh, and then the U.S. is increasingly the odd man, uh, say in this in this country or Even worse than yes. So long as it's all about total lives and different. Uh, we uh, we have a real now choosing new research directors, um, <laughs> even maybe especially disciplinary boundaries. So, what advice would you give to the new researcher choosing of research? There's a couple of things that occur to me. One has to do with issues that is don't just uh, focus narrowly on your choices and, and nothing else. Uh, because at the recent age, what inspires research questions have a lot of with moving in two different disciplines. Uh, it's different disciplines within the super science areas, such as economics. Anthropology is very distant, but okay, like science and then economics for me, while well, some parts of them labor in particular, I mean, they may ask questions in a different way than do sociologists, right? Or like scientists. We all have different ways of posing questions, of identifying what is the interest for our research. So if you also follow up what the economists do. You're seeing things that we're not doing sociology, vice versa. So that interdisciplinary is a source of I think asking questions that your discipline didn't ask before. Uh, so I think that that's one of them, one of the one of the important sources of uh, uh, the other one is how to ask a question. And this is my sort of uh, advice 101 to uh, graduate students, PhD students. How do you ask a question in, in your uh, research? And what I always tell is the you have the the first thing you say is under what conditions? Under what conditions will work class women have a child? Under what conditions will 
the higher duty would be more stable than the low duty. Under what conditions would it be ever be brought? What other and once you start thinking under what conditions, sort of this, the, it's, it's in your chip of your academic brain, you look for the mechanisms that are shaping an outcome. And what we too many started with graduate students, PhD students, and academics, even very much academics, they don't think in that way of what are the conditions that are operating here. How do I dig out the drivers of this and that phenomenon? And that's, that's why I always say, I, I, I don't have to teach you that much um, or talk and ask about. And that this was part number one in the metaphysical case. Under what conditions? And uh, don't start anything, don't read anything, don't write anything in your discipline before you ask the right way. Which is unconscious, will this happen or not? And that gets you to, instead of describing to into an analytic mode of medium. So, I mean, those are my two big uh, principles. That, uh, I think those are the ones that come to mind in, in terms of this. Well, um, thanks for being the talk with us today and uh, yeah, teaching us so much as we interview and also in your work. And uh, yeah. it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure.